Hello, everybody, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Console Log Podcast. This is episode number 47, the week of August 1st through August 7th. Welcome to the wonderful month of August, a month where the heat in New York is reaching a horrible fever pitch, one that is barely able to be withstood. I get on the subway platform nowadays and I just start to drip myself into pieces because it is just so freaking hot outside. I was excited to hear everybody's feedback this past week about the podcast. Loved hearing everyone's uh, excitement and enjoyment of the podcast. I appreciate people still wanting to see this uploaded on YouTube, so I will keep doing that for now. I'm actually going to try a little experiment this week where I have just my uh, laptop's webcam recording me. So if you actually want to see me talking into the um, uh, into the camera for a long period of time, you're welcome to do that. But mostly it's just going to be talking and looking at the things from this past week. Wonder how your week of coding has been. Uh, for those of you who are watching this on YouTube with the video, uh, I am having some wine. This is my little uh, wine to make sure that my throat can stay nice and lubricated so that as I talk for 30 minutes, I don't have a fear of having a cough during it. Don't know if you saw on my YouTube channel, I have a new video up about how I upgraded the Console Logs website from Gatsby version 1 to Gatsby version 2. It was a nice, fun, easy upgrade, one that was fun to record, hopefully was educational and fun for you to watch as well. And there's not much really else to say about that. I'm on back on paternity leave at work, focusing on my baby boy, making sure that he is happy, healthy, and learning code. Not really, but somewhat really. Um, with that being said, uh, let's start the show. The first piece of news that I want to share with you this week, which is the smallest, biggest piece of news, is the smallest, it's not even a blog post, it's almost tweet-sized in length. Uh, GitHub has part of their change log, uh, I guess it's part of their blog, but it's more of a minor update than it is an actual huge blog post. It's a very simply titled, Unselectable Diff Markers. The plus and minus diff markers are no longer copied to your clipboard when you copy the contents of a diff. And it might take a second for you to actually parse what that means, but let me just spell it out for you. If you've ever had to copy and paste code from a diff on GitHub and paste it to a friend, you'll know that those pluses and minuses are copied along with that content, which is just annoying. You don't want that. You don't need those pluses or minuses. And this update on the GitHub blog is letting it be known that that is no longer the case. So that is like, for for small wins that have a big impact, that one is huge. Rather than it being actually text on the web page, it's now using the before and after CSS uh, pseudo element selector so that you don't have that actually be part of your clipboard. I don't know why it took this long to do that, but I'm not really gonna look a get horse in the mouth because this is the most exciting thing ever because all of the countless amounts of times that developers have wasted just deleting those pluses and minuses when pacing things, now we don't have to worry about it anymore. So in terms of small wins with big impacts, this is one is way up there on the list of things to do. In the world of React and Redux, there was an interesting PR opened, it wasn't a PR, it was a issue. Let me just double check before I tell you wrong information. That's one of my biggest fears about doing these episodes is that I tell you something wrong and then you tell somebody else what I said, and then it's just all on me from being the imbecile who told you the wrong piece of information. So I'm glad I checked. This is a simple GitHub issue from May 13th, but I'm just now seeing it today. And it's detailing the roadmap for React Redux, everybody's favorite binding library between Redux and React. And it lays out a roadmap on how to get React Redux to be async compatible for the future versions of React. And the roadmap that's laid out is that the next release of uh, React Redux would be 5.1, and the goal of this release would be to remove all async unsafe lifecycle methods from the library. Right now, if you were to try to enable safe mo uh, strict mode in your React application and you do use React Redux, you get many warnings because React Redux still uses old, now deprecated APIs such as component will mount, component uh, will receive props, all those things that have been removed in preparation for future versions of React that will be async and suspense and all those fun things. 
So the, the goal of 5.1 is that they will remove all those warnings so that you don't have to see your console be spammed constantly and it's not even your fault. So that'll be a nice, easy, simple upgrade. Uh, then the next version would be a breaking change, would be version 6.0. And this is more of a whiz-bang update in the sense that it would uh, use the new context API from React. It would use the forward ref API, which makes it easier to have higher order components that expose references to the components that they are wrapping. And it will also be async React compatible, similar to how they're trying to remove the un unsafe lifecycle warnings. And the gotcha here, because they are looking to use the new context API, is that it would require at least React 16.3. So if your React applications are still using an older version, this would not be the version for you. However, if you are making a new application or you are able to upgrade, then this would be the thing that you would use. And then the next version after 6.0 would be 7.0, and that's kind of the more blue sky, not really sure what it would actually look like. And as the uh, one of the lead maintainers of React Redux, Mark Erickson, wrote in this issue, uh, 7.0 is more of a full-on rethink of the React Redux API, taking, to, taking into consideration things like React suspense and async rendering, render props, and so on. It's the things that, it's, it's pretty much uh, React Redux version 2.0, except to be version 7.0, just because that's how it is. Probably almost a different library underneath the hood. I, I would be surprised to see how much lines of code I'll actually share from the older versions, but that is the cost of progress. Someone's gotta throw away things that are old, making things that are new. So that's a thing that I'm excited about. I'm still a big fan of Redux, use it in most of my React applications. The fact that it does still throw those unsafe lifecycle warnings is a big reason why I don't actually upgrade. Uh, I'm not even really worrying about trying to become having my application be strict mode compliant because I know React Redux would be the biggest offender in that case. But it's good to see the React Redux team thinking about this. They've always been Mark Erickson in particular is always very careful and 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 considered to make sure that any changes to React Redux has the least amount of impact for the community at large because there are so many people out there that use React Redux that to make anything in haste that could potentially alienate users and make their day-to-day -day lives worse is not a goal of his at all. So appreciate the even measured and thoughtful approach towards these upgrades. And then I think I have uh, two more things about React because I just do enjoy talking about React a lot, uh, unfortunately for you who don't like React, but hopefully you do. Uh, this is actually one that shares uh, news with React, uh, Vue, and Preact, all the most popular front-end frameworks. And it was a blog post on the React uh, blog about how they actually released a server-side vulnerability fix. There was actually a uh, security vulnerability in server-rendered React apps that whilst the React team was investigating it, they also got into contact with the Vue team and the Preact team to release the fix uh, pretty much at the same time. So that's amazing collaboration amongst different front side uh, frameworks to make sure that they're making the best and most safe applications for the entire team. Uh, the blog post is interesting going to about how, uh, like in, in which situations you could actually become vulnerable to this security issue. And it's a very specific use case, one that probably 99% of React applications would not be affected by, not even exaggerating. The two cases is one, uh, if your app is being rendered to HTML using the React DOM server API, and two, if your app allows a user, like a user, to supply an attribute name that can be used on an HTML tag. So if a user can supply a attribute for a H, uh, to an HTML tag, they were not properly escaping any vulnerabilities such that a user could close the div tag and do like alert, hello, and actually take advantage of that application. It's a very small use case, but one that still is in a vulnerability. So having that be patched, view Preact, React, you are safe and golden. And last but not least, I watched a very, very great presentation this past week from the Chain React conference. This is a talk called The State of React Native by Ram N, an engineer on the React Native team. And this has been one of the best presentations I've seen on how React Native actually works underneath the hood. It's a question that I've had a very vague understanding of in the past, and the 
visuals and the explanations that Ram N goes into describing how React Native currently works were perfect. They were the right level of detail, the right level of abstraction that lets you actually understand if you were to start trying to hack on React Native, you actually have a good foundational context about where things are. For example, if you were to ever start working on React Native full time, this would be an excellent onboarding video to understand what things are. And the first half of the video talks about um, how React Native currently works, how in the current world of React Native, you have the JavaScript VM, which is where your JavaScript code, your React code lives. And when that code is ran by the React Native framework, it takes that JavaScript VM that is then shipped over to a shadow tree, which is in a non-UI thread, but in native land. The shadow tree is a shadow representation of your JavaScript React tree. And so it can do a lot of optimizations in the shadow tree, such as finding where they can send the least amount of information to the UI thread to make the updates that are required and other sorts of optimizations. And once that's done, the shadow tree then updates the UI thread. And the UI thread is the place where it is like the most delicate of all places because if you cause the frame rate to drop from 60 frames per second, the user will notice and think that your application is garbage and that you are not a good engineer and delete your app and cause you to cry in a corner wondering what you have done to make the React Native gods so angry at you. I'm kidding, it's not true, but... Uh, another thing that's interesting about the current world of React Native is that the JavaScript VM to native bridge is always async. So no matter what, your communications between JavaScript and the native world is async no matter what, which means that if you have a user typing in an input field, there are there's a known use case, not use case, there's a known bad code path where if a user is rapidly typing, your application can get into a bad state because as updates are sent from native to uh, JavaScript and then from JavaScript back to native, you can have a race condition where updates come in too fast, but the updates from JavaScript to native don't come out fast enough. The way they fix this right now is the debalance, which is definitely a hack around the problem, not necessarily a fix at all. But the second half of this video delves into the ongoing, the current ongoing rewrite of uh, React Native, uh, currently titled Fabric. And Fabric is taking a page from many of the goals of React Fiber, which was the big rewrite for React 16. And the two high-level goals are, uh, I mean, the big feature that React Fiber and then React Fabric for React Native will unleash is letting there be both high-priority and low-priority updates. So, for example, when I was talking about the user typing into the input field, that would be a high-priority update, meaning that those changes could actually be done in a synchronous manner, which would actually ameliorate many common pain points that people have with React Native. And it's funny to say in such a simple way that, oh, Fabric is going to let you actually have it be able to do synchronous updates, but the journey to get there is so much bigger than that one sentence alone. It makes me chuckle to no degree. Uh, and Ram goes into what they're actually working, the, the features and changes that they're, that they're making to the React Native architecture, the internal architecture to achieve those goals. Uh, one of the things that they're working on is making it so that the shadow tree, which currently is only on its own thread, they're making it so that the shadow tree can be ran on any thread. Um, so that means that if they want, if there's a high priority update such as scrolling or an input changing, those can happen on the same thread as the UI, making sure those updates are seen immediately. Uh, low priority updates can then also remain on a separate thread because you don't have to worry about getting a response from the API immediately. You can just have that be done in a background thread. Uh, and to make sure that now that, that a shadow tree can be ran on multiple threads, you don't have the issue of it being having to be thread safe, which as a JavaScript engineer, you don't have to really worry about, but as a native engineer, you do. And the way that trying to accomplish making sure that the shadow tree can be thread safe is by making the shadow tree immutable, which is a lovely turn of page from current trends in the JavaScript community as well. And you know, by having it be immutable, it means that no matter what thread mutates the shadow tree, it will be consistent. So another thing that they're doing is that right now, the JavaScript VM runs on C++ with V8 or the JavaScript core in iOS. Yoga, which is the layout engine, runs on C++ as well. On Android, with uh, Android writing on, written in Java, the current shadow tree is, is right now also written in Java. And that causes a cost because 
going from C++ and JavaScript to then Java to the background thread to then Java to the UI thread is not as efficient as if it could have the shadow thread also in the same language as JavaScript and Yoga. So they're working on converting the shadow tree to Britain to C++ as well. And those are, amongst other internal architecture things, those are the two high-level changes they're working on to make the cost of updating things from JavaScript to native not as painful as in the past. And the goal that he states in this is that no code in user land should change, everything should remain the same. I imagine there'll be a few gotchas you have to be worried about, but ultimately your React Native pre-fabric will work the same as post-fabric, which is the same goal as React Fiber, pre-fiber and post-fiber. So amazing feats of engineering that's going on right now. No timeline given on when this would be out. Very curious to try it again. Uh, I love working with React Native in the past, really fun to play with. The fact that they're taking all they've learned in the past and applying it here is just a great step in the right direction. I'm, I'm very curious to see how that'll actually feel you play it with your hands, but for now I'm just gonna just sit in the silence and watch them work on it. Here's just a very weird tweet that I saw this past week uh, from one of the, from an engineer at uh, Facebook, uh, Christoph Nakazawa, if I said that correct, but the tweet says that uh, Yarn is now responsible for almost half, 48% of all package downloads from the NPM registry, Yarn being a different NPM client. And somebody replied saying, how do you how do you know that? And he says he asked NPM, which is a very easy way to get to that source of truth. I don't really have anything else to say about this. I just think it's interesting. It shows definitely the rapid success that Yarn has enjoyed. And also competition is always good because it pushes people to make better things. But if you're using Yarn in your workplace, now feel comfortable that almost half of downloads are because of your usage. So kudos to you. And you know that I love the TC39 process. There was a new proposal added to the TC39 process, this new static method on the promise object called all settled. And all settled is very similar to promise dot all it, with one big difference. Uh, when you use promise.all and you have three promises that, are, that you're waiting to be resolved, if any one of those promises rejects, the entire promise.all uh, promise chain is immediately rejected. They don't wait for any of the other promises to resolve, it just rejects immediately, which means that if you have some page that you're making three API calls, you, don't, you just want all of them to complete before you really care about anything, promise.all will actually short circuit before it'll actually let all those things complete. And that's where promise.all settled comes as the counterpoint to that, where uh, promise.all settled will return a promise that is fulfilled with an array of promise state snapshots, but only after all of those original promises have settled. And promise.all settled doesn't care if it rejects or resolve, it just wants to know when it becomes, when it, when it moves from no longer being uh, pending. This is a great API. I think, I think I don't really have any objection to this. I don't know who would have an objection to this. It'll definitely make common UI idioms easier to do rather than having to worry about having a handler for your promise that all chain that you run for both dot then and dot catch. Now you can just use promise dot all sell because that's the true intention of what you actually want to do. And let me round off this week of the console log with a blog post from Chrome about Chrome 69 beta. This looking through this release is big. <laughs> a lot of things are new here. And I'm just gonna go through and tell you some of the things that I think are the most exciting. The first one that is most exciting is the ability to have CSS scroll snap positions. These are new CSS properties that you can set on elements. And what this enables you to do is create common UX scroll patterns without the need for JavaScript. If you've ever had a carousel where you can slide through multiple images and when you slide and people stop sliding, it centers on an image so that it snaps to an image. That's what this is doing natively. So it means that you can actually make an entire carousel without needing JavaScript at all. I don't really know what the non-Chrome support of this is going to be, but the fact, uh, it says, as of June 2018, IE, Edge, and Firefox ship a deprecated version of this specification uh, Safari ships the current specification, which is what Chrome is implementing as well. So this will be for uh, 
usage across all browsers. So I'm looking forward to the next big CSS only carousel library that gets viral because of this new feature that opens that up for you. The way to add this in looks very simple, very, very exciting. The other thing that's awesome is that Chrome is finally supporting what they're calling display cutouts. But when the iPhone X first came out, the Safari team had a Safari, the Safari WebKit team had a blog post about how they're adding a new meta uh, property uh, called viewport with a value of viewport fit cover, which was their attempt at solving the problem with iPhone X having that cutout at the top of the screen, which now for some inexplicable reason, many Android phone manufacturers are doing as well. I don't think this is a, this is a workaround to a problem that, that Apple made. It's not really a design goal. I don't think somebody woke up and was like, how can we make this design better? We're going to add a cutout to the top of the screen. That, 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 makes, that, that, that makes no sense to me at all. But to make the websites actually look correct and take into account this cutout, the Safari team added this meta name viewport, content viewport fit cover to actually allow you to control how your website is laid out to take into account that cutout. Chrome is now supporting that as well for their mobile browsers. So good. Uh, other things that's crazy is there's a new interface called off-screen canvas that will allow 2D and WebGL canvas learning to be used in workers. So this allows you to do some UI work in a worker to potentially do optimizations across those threads. I don't even know how that would actually help you, but uh, that's, that's, that's wild. I guess you can actually uh, draw in a thread, which means that you can, uh, uh, it will increase parallelism in web locations and improve performance multi-core systems. So you can actually, uh, the web is moving to a multi-core place. That's exciting. That's not scary at all. And there's all these other releases in here. Those are the ones that I was most excited about by far, though. So you got the CSS scroll snap, display cutouts, and being able to do some canvas work in a worker thread. Okay, that was the console log episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Happy to hear your thoughts, concerns, and other opinions in any form of feedback. I have discussed comments. Uh, that's D-A-I-S-Q-U-S on the console log website. So you're welcome to put comments on there as well to hear let me hear about what you think about the podcast. I will be back uh, next week, maybe. Next week, I'm going to react rallies. So that might be a little bit difficult, but stay tuned. I'll let you know about that as it approaches. And I hope you have a great rest of the week coding. And I hope to see you again when I am back in your ears. Till then, I will talk to you and say goodbye.